Men ask me, Jeff, my wife is going to therapy and she says she's working on herself. She's working to love herself, but I don't really know what that means. And I don't really know what that means for our marriage or is this helping? It seems as though she's actually distancing herself a lot of the time. A man emailed me this morning about this exact topic when we sent a notice to our list for this exact topic. He emailed me this this morning, which puts it very well. He said, hi, Jeff, great topic today, one that closely pertains to my situation and probably many of the men on the call. I get nervous every week when my wife sees her individual therapist and understandably shares nothing with me about her goals. For all I know, she's using all that time and money to work on herself in the form of gathering the courage to end our marriage and become independent in a new life she envisions. However, it's worth the risk because I do accept that our marriage has 0% chance of reconciling into the kind of loving relationship I want until A, she rediscovers how to love herself and B, quiets her immature inner child that has led to her to think it's my role to make her happy. Okay, let me try that again. Quiets her immature inner child that has led her to think it's my role to make her happy. Looking forward to the discussion today and saying thank you. Okay, so these two pieces, Cynthia, and what are you seeing here? Yes, of course, and I have lots of research we're going to get into today. We've got three points that we're going to have you for you before the end of the call of takeaways for mindset, how to change your mindset around this. And so we have a lot to get into today. But Cynthia in particular, until she rediscovers how to love herself and quiets her immature inner child that has led her to think it's my role to make her happy which that, I don't know if she said that, maybe she said that, maybe it's an assumption, maybe she presents herself like that. Oh, it's your job to make me happy. Until those two things, there's zero chance of reconciling into the kind of relationship, the loving relationship that I want. So let's start here. What's your initial impression from this man and from what his wife is doing in individual therapy and what we've seen many, many times in our group calls and in our coaching sessions? Let's start there. Yeah, well, gosh, I really appreciate this email. I am curious if the wording she's like rediscovers how to love herself and then, you know, she quiets these parts of her to create a marriage that can make this gentleman like be like, this is the kind of relationship I want. I'm not sure how much of that is his incredible framing or it's things that she said. It's powerful if these are her words, because there is an element that's absolutely true that for you as a man to be in the kind of relationship you want, that level three relationship, absolutely your wife or the woman you're with does need to love herself. But I'll really say love the feminine parts of herself because those are the parts that in traditional therapy, when a woman goes to work on herself to love herself, it actually often ends up being that she's trying to be a little bit more masculine. She's trying to shoehorn herself into better habits and behaviors and thoughts that will feel easier to her, that give her more freedom. And there can be the tendency of still trying to sweep and push away more feminine parts of herself. And, the, and the, her second part, the B, quiets her immature child. And, and yeah, so, yeah. so she can make herself happy. Absolutely. And of course, that's her taking some responsibility and accountability. And again, I think this is also a way that women try to guard themselves from ever feeling disappointed, ever feeling sad, ever feeling left down in their feminine, because they have this idea of, I just have these anchors in myself that are strong enough, I'll never feel that. And I'll always be the one driving my own ship. And there's light parts of that and dark parts of that. There's parts of that that work beautifully in a polarized relationship and parts of that that we need a different level of understanding. Yeah, good. We're going to get into a lot of that today. So let me ask, if you zoom out 
Why is it, or what do you think the reason is that in traditional therapy, she it's suggested that her masculine tasking individuality is strengthened and there's not much discussion of the more feminine energy that we talk about here? That's a really good question. I think we have a certain idea in our world and our culture of what powerful attitudes and behaviors are, and that tends to lead to more masculine thought processes and holdings of oneself. And there's not a lot known about what actually is empowering and powerful in a woman's natural feminine energy. Okay, let's let's step forward. So here on the C-Note Show, of course, we teach deep conscious intimacy, what we call level three intimacy, because love and being loved is an art. It's a verb, it's an action, it's an ever-growing way of being for yourself and in relationship. Last time we spoke about relationship repair after an argument, so go back to the previous video and watch that. If you're on YouTube, we've got a YouTube channel with hundreds and hundreds of videos. And today, my wife is working to love herself, but does that help our marriage? Brene Brown, social researcher, of course, we, if you've been doing this work, you've heard of Brene Brown. One of her quotes, love is not something we give or get. It's something that we nurture and grow, a connection that can only be cultivated between two people when it exists within each one of them. We can only love others as much as we love ourselves. And this is the idea of what I would argue is healthy self-love. And I want to ask Cynthia today, so when a woman says, I want to love myself, that that's not always done in a healthy way. And that's what there's fear that comes up in a man and he doesn't know what to do about that or what is she talking with her therapist about? And then we have this desire to control, which is the wrong direction. It's we want to move in a healthy direction. Again, Brene Brown, these are these are actually fantastic top 10 rules for self-love. You are enough. Share your whole story and your whole heart. Engage with the world. Vulnerability is the birth, birthplace of love. Vulnerability, again, let go of your armor. And I could ask Cynthia about every one of these things, and I think she'd agree with it, including let go of the armor. Speak to yourself the way you speak to someone you love. Let go of perfectionism. Be grateful. Pra practice authenticity. So off the cuff, Cynthia, how is let go of your armor different than I need to defend myself and be an individual in the world that she may be seeing in therapy? How is that idea different? Yeah, there's a so there's women who do women's work. There's a, a an uh, adage, an energy, a reminder that you as a woman doing work or getting control or healing yourself is not a pursuit of perpetual summer. As in, once you love yourself, once you heal yourself, forever and ever, it's warm and golden sun. There is an understanding that there's seasons there's dips, there's always going to be triggers in relationship, there's always going to be, even you've done, you know, 10 years of self-worth and every day you look in the mirror and I love myself, there are going to be moments that are still disappointing and hard and there's grief uh, and there's regret. And so what I see Brene Brown saying is, you can be empowered and it's not a like holding the shield out from yourself to, pre to prevent anything uncomfortable, anything hard, anything sad. It's trusting in yourself that you can feel what's ever there. And when we feel what's ever there, when a woman feels you, it is going to be all seasons and a, and a powerful feminine and loving herself can welcome that in her highest spiritual moments, have human moments where she doesn't want to feel all that, but also recognize that this is the ever evolving experience. So that's the best case. That's more of a healthy approach to this. Yeah. Is there a man that's in the middle of this now that wants to come and has concerns about this or want to bounce something off of us, a question of us? Yeah. There's men in the chat. The email is coming from insecurity, potentially, right? When we have fear and we want to control, could that be coming from insecurity, potentially? But the man wrote, my wife went to work on herself through therapy and claims it ended up teaching her that she needed to move on from me and the expectations of marriage. She needed to learn how to love herself. At one point when she stopped therapy, I asked why. She in turn asked me, are you sure you want me to keep going? 
implying that it will put the nail in the coffin for our marriage. And it did. Other man, for what it's worth, my wife was going to therapy without my knowing it. And her main therapeutic goal was to get the courage to end the marriage. Man said, it seemed like it was the same for mine. So this is the question, guys, right? If she goes to therapy and tells this therapist, I want to grow the courage to leave my husband, that's her prerogative. We obviously can't change that. We can't force that. But if she goes to therapy and says, I want to learn to love myself, and the first position of that, let's say, not good therapist is to tell her, well, because I during research, and I'll show some more of this, there's some not good approaches, which the number one item is stand up for yourself, have boundaries, leave a toxic relationship if you're being injured in this relationship. Mm -hmm. That's the number one bullet point in some of poor articles that I found. Not Brene Brown. That's not what Brene Brown says. She's talking about engaging in the world, opening her, your whole heart. Be grateful, be authentic. But some articles will say, basically, leave your relationship. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Why do you think some approaches to this self-love are to, let's say, victimize yourself or label so something outside of your herself, let's say, as toxic? Mm -hmm. And the number one step is to leave that. Why do you think that's the case? Yeah, so I think... Uh, on both sides of the story, I think because there's a still a fundamental misunderstanding that yes, as men and women, our brains work differently. There is very easy to then label the opposite sex as doing something wrong. There is a huge pull for women to want to learn to have boundaries and to want to label another because in the essence of being a woman, the thing that she might be really not like about herself, or I could even go really deep and say that she hates about herself, is her natural watery stance. How easy it is for her to flow into the containers of relationship, whether it's work, whether it's love. And that's a very courageous thing for a woman to recognize and embrace in herself. And so it is almost like, it feels like the answer to all the vulnerability, all the uncertainty, all the lack of trust in herself to just be like, if I just have steel hard boundaries and if I can make this other person wrong, then I will not feel so swayed myself. I will feel empowered and powerful. And whatever that takes right now in my life, that's what I want to feel. Sure. So for you as a man, it's, well, what do I do then? Well, number one, to be aware of these things gives you skill and presence. Meaning if I know that maybe she's being given these other messages, I'm not going to be surprised by it. And I have a higher vision, a deeper conscious vision of what intimacy is to me. And I breathe that into my life elsewhere through connections, through working out, through success in the world, through nature, breathing in and filling yourself up with that. And so that you're not like was written insecure or needing her to fill you up. That's a core piece of this work as a man, right? Her experiences with men influence her. I wonder if sometimes this has to do with the therapy beliefs about men, the therapist's belief about men. It, yeah, absolutely. And there's good practitioners and there's bad practitioners, right? My wife's first therapist said it sounded like I was a narcissist, never met me, and I was in therapy at the same time, and that therapist was divorced. Okay, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is a part of all of this world, right? Because marriages have become like appliances of the new world, overall too much effort, resource, understanding in order to fix, so they get thrown out. But then you have to be willing to take the time to understand the workings of the new appliance, which won't function or react like the one you threw out instead of fixing. Yeah, this is why we so lament, every one of us, that we wish we would have learned this earlier in life. It would, wouldn't this have been nice to be downloaded to us as a teenager, for instance, and that's part of the, what I would say is masculine existential pain, the, the crisis of realizing there is time behind us, but what are we going to do with this challenge that we face? And a part of this is accepting the challenge that we currently face. And I love you men here. Yes. Giving perspective and wanting to learn, wanting, how do I step forward in a more skillful way? So quickly, there's a couple of articles, and this is one I was making the point of, this is from the Berkeley Well-Being Institute written by this PhD here. And this is one snippet I want to ask Cynthia about. 
So what does it look like when you don't love yourself? And this is black and white thinking that I think is painful that we as leaders and as men and as compassionate partners in relationship need to hold space for some of our own black and white thinking, like not fall into it and to have compassion if she falls into black and white thinking and not just see it as objectively true. So what does it look like when we're, when you don't love yourself, when we don't love ourselves, we're likely to have more negative feelings and self-focused emotions, for example. So if, if I'm a woman and I'm reading this, or if I'm a person that's uh, not wanting to open to the relationship right now, wanting to find someone to blame man or a woman, if I'm wanting to pin this on someone else or play the victim. And I think, Oh, if I feel any of these emotions, that means I don't love myself. Something is wrong. Mm -hmm. If I ever feel inadequate, if I ever feel shame or angry or driven to prove myself or lonely or guilty or feel rejected, if I don't, if I feel any of those, that means I don't love myself. So what do you see in this approach? How would you frame this to a woman or a man? How would you frame this about loving yourself in about these emotions here? Hmm. Oh, it's quite the experience to be human, isn't it? So my approach would be, let's say I was working with a woman in a, in a coaching setting. It's, it's good to know that we have different parts, that she has different parts of herself. And to, yes, foster a part of herself that feels so empowered, feels like herself, feels like her truest self, feels like she trusts this, we could even say this divine part of herself. And, and some women might visualize that like, oh, it's a certain tree that reminds her of this powerful, loving entity inside of her, uh, or it's an archetype, or it's a color. But then also her strength, her sensuality, her ability to show up in relationship with you depends on also feeling a part of herself that sometimes feels so inadequate or so ashamed or so rejected that the higher part of herself, the strong part, or even the warrioress part of herself doesn't go away just because she's having those human experiences. That's what it would offer to her. And I say that's part of her sensuality and her ability to show up with you in this kind of incredible relationship because I don't want her static and always feeling confident I want her to be able to touch in the humanness of herself, the humanness in you, and learn almost an inner chuckle about it, or what is the playfulness in this. And again, in women's work, women work with archetypes to represent, hey, there's always going to be this shadowy part of myself, and how can I allow that to have power and excitement, if not tremendous impact on how I open, how I'm sensual, uh, and how I want to be feminine and alive in relationship with masculine energy. Yeah. And in my one-on-one -on -one coaching, in our group coaching, it's how do I present myself? So I want to ask you, how do I present myself as a man to foster that? And so how is it, how important is it for a man to believe those things about himself, that it's okay I feel insecure once in a while. It's okay that I feel lonely or shameful or rejected. And that doesn't mean that I'm a bad person. How important is it for the man to model those things in his heart, in his soul, not just in words, but in the way he's acting, the way he's standing in the face of challenge? How important is that modeling for her? <sighs> So I mentioned earlier that women find the weak part of themselves. They feel like the weak part of themselves is the one who's so easily swayed by another. But the amazing thing that she's so wonderfully easily swayed by others means that you have tremendous power to set the tone on the, and this is more of like a feminine talk about it, but the beauty of being human 
the there's safety to have different experiences and, and emotions in relationship and that you have a calibration with that. It can, even if you don't say a single thing, but she can feel that in you, it can have tremendous sway, not only on her ability to share her different states, her different parts with you to feel safe. But if you're trusting of these elements in your being, it even teaches her to trust those elements in her. So guys that are here, how do you, how do you trust that element in yourself? How do you trust that you're okay, even if you're having a terrible day or anger or shame comes in? How, how do you model? There's men here who've been doing this work for a long time. I'd love to hear a couple of you. How do you keep centered in yourself? How do you open your heart, even in the face of challenge in a particular day? What do you do for yourself? Unmute yourself and come on in. I think the first step on it is to recognize when those feelings are coming right? Especially the negative ones, right? Like for example, yesterday I was, I think I was cooking. I can't remember it was breakfast or something, you know, and I was getting frustrated because stuff was happening too quick, right? I had eggs frying over here. I had bread toasting somewhere else. I had water boiling, coffee making. I had all kinds of stuff going, right? So, and I started like falling behind and I felt myself starting to like, wanted to like curse, right? And I was like, okay, what's going on here? So I pause for a second, you know, turn the toaster off, right? Just lower the temperatures. All right, like, give me a second here. What's going on here? I can feel it, right? The the emotion starting to build and, and I wanted to just like yell and cuss, you know? And the, I think the first step is to recognize that, right? And put a stop to it. And okay, how can I turn it around, right? Mm -hmm. And then just concentrate on one thing at a time, right? Okay, the toast doesn't need to be toasted right away. That can wait a little bit. So, you know, I think, so the first step is to, identify it, right? And control it, right? Feel it and release it. I think that's one of the first steps, I think, to start working towards being a little bit more positive, I guess, and mm -hmm. don't let things affect yeah. emotions. Definitely. And to care, to be aware, to notice those things. So what's what's the most challenging for you? It's one thing, things going on in the kitchen. Okay, I can practice. That's great. Where is a yeah. hard, where's a hard place for you to notice your emotions, a hard place for you to calm yourself down? When... Like if my wife tells me something that I should be doing that I'm not doing, right? Like about a week ago or something that she came to me. No, well, we had a talk, right? And she actually told me that when she talked to her therapist, I guess this is kind of related to that. At one point, they got into the conversation. She was telling me they got into the conversation of how does she feel about the romance and the relationship and and she was like well i feel like burned out and i and i because i gotta do this that i gotta pretty much gotta keep the house running and her therapist she told me that told her that pretty much i'm becoming her child right and i and i took it i took it you know i mean it hurt for a little bit right but you know i didn't say anything just kind of let it flow through it and i was like all right i i see it you know i can i can understand that right how that Heals because, and so I told her, you know, like the reason why sometimes it's hard for me is due to my job too, right? Because if I have three days off, by the time I come home, I'm, I almost feel like a stranger because I have no idea what has happened while I was gone because we don't, we rarely talk on the phone, right? And text messages are very rare also. So by the time I come home that day one, I'm readjusting back to the family life. From being on the road by day two i have a little bit of feel of what's going on by day three i gotta get ready to leave again oh. right so it's hard to get into this groove of like okay the, the kids need dental appointment maybe i can take him to this okay they need to do this they need to be taken to tumbling classes ice skating classes uh, whatever the case might be it's hard for me to get into this groove we don't really have sometimes two or three days off, you know? And she was like, oh, okay, I, I can see that, you know? And and so we got into the talk and I was like, what we need here is better conversations and better communication between both of us that is going to take some of that burden off of you, you know? Because if we don't talk, it's the way for me to know what's going on. Yeah, so what you said to the getting past the initial defensiveness or being yeah. upset of what she's saying is a, such a huge key, something that I've had to work on intensely over time. That's a great example. And then you can say, okay, well, here's what I'd like to do. Here's what we do need. 
here's where we can be better with each other if we get past that defensive reaction. Yeah. Yeah. Great stuff. Thanks. Appreciate it. Good yep. to see you. Come on in. Thanks for raising your hand. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and I can totally relate there about uh, the first step really being sitting with the feeling and recognizing it. And, and I would add uh, a kind of a, a big step for me is to be aware of the story I'm telling myself. You know, right, right now, my wife at her therapist right now, as we speak, and that was my email to kind of kick things off today because uh, I do feel a lot of insecurity around that. But I also recognize that I'm telling myself a story. I'm telling myself a story that she goes to her therapist to bash me. And this younger woman who's her therapist is just telling her everything she wants to hear. And she's going to come back and be even more distant to me. And I don't know that to be true. It, it could be. Um, but I'm I'm recognizing that I can't control that. And when you're anxious, preoccupied, like uh, probably some of us are, the monkey brain just uh, spins out of control. But just stopping and recognizing the story and and the factual aspect or non-factual aspect of it is is really important, I think. That's really well said. That's fantastic. So if you were to take one more step with us right now, do you have a, a question either either for yourself that you're working through or a question about you know, the spot in your relationship you'd like to ask? No, you know, it, it, I think the hardest part for me is that during the informal type separation, like we have in the house, that it's just kind of a boundary. It's off limits to really, really talk from the heart right now. We did a lot of that and it was spinning out of control. So I think we kind of tried to stop the bleeding with it and just be more co-parents right now and, and, and try to, to coexist nicely, which, which we are. Um, but, you know, so much of it, I, I think is, is really going to come down to uh, giving her that that space that she needs. Like I said in my email, I absolutely believe that our our relationship has zero percent chance of of reconciling until she overcomes a lot of her her pain and and feeling that she's not enough, and also that she gain some of that maturity like I have that it's not not my responsibility to make her happy. Sure. That's, that's well put the, the speaking from the heart. I'm sure you've heard of the concept of, well, we need to be in a good place when we communicate so that we can grow up more healthy communication and more happy, joyous <laughs> communication. Often the speaking from the heart can be all the stuff that we don't like about each other or our painful things. And then it can spiral in that direction. Have, have you heard of that before? Yes. Yes, I have. And uh, that's what I'm trying to avoid right now. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I, hear your open heart that you have for her and for yourself, this journey for yourself. What's the story I'm telling myself? What else are you seeing? It sounds like you have this incredible ability to kind of stand on the mountain and survey the landscape. And I really appreciate that in doing it. It almost feels like you're willing to see and hear and understand, you know, what your wife is is working through, but again, holding that kind of kingly eye of, I can be a container for this without taking it on as anything I have to do or anything that's made bad or wrong. And I really, God, I really appreciate how you're doing that. Yeah. Good stuff. Thanks. Thank you for coming in. I really like both the examples that the two gentlemen shared first, because they're very, they're very real examples. What comes to mind for me when you ask this question is, I, th I think what made all the difference in my life at this point was realizing that this is super normal to experience these things. Mm -hmm. And and then to be able to allow myself to experience those things because they're just another part of life. You know, whatever challenges, whatever hard emotions I might feel. Well, if I don't feel them, then I'm really not experiencing life at its completion. Mm -hmm. And so when I do feel them, I'm able to say, this is fine. I can be present in this. I can allow it to exist. You know, whether I'm cooking breakfast and it's overwhelming or, you know, my wife is at the therapist, N not my case, but could be, you know, and, and I'm going to come home to whatever that looks like, or she's going to come home to whatever. Um, and just being able to say, whatever that experience is for me, I'm, I'm just living. Like that's all part of life is the anxiety, the pain, the joy, like ups and downs. It's, it's all normal. I'm allowed to experience it. That's well said. Part of this level three deep conscious intimacy within our own selves and with our relationship is 
knowing that the journey's never over, that it's okay to feel bad emotions and good emotions and neither mean anything more about us than they need to. We're always on this adventure. I absolutely, yeah, I appreciate that. Well, and that shapes my story to uh, the, the other gentleman's point, which is immensely helpful when I don't want to have a shitty story. Yeah, thanks for coming in. Let's jump forward to our three takeaways from today, three ideas for a mindset shift. And by the way, if if you're watching this, let's say on YouTube or some other place, and you want to be on these calls and you want to get our updates for our book that's coming up and releases for new teaching videos, free teaching videos, go to greatmenmovemountains.com slash new subscriber and punch in your info and you'll be on our notification list for all these calls and such. So my wife is working to love herself, but does that help our marriage takeaways for today? And we'll talk with Cynthia about this. Number one, each of us is always on an individual journey as well as a journey of relationship together. And one mistake that I made in the past was to think that if I did enough, if I earned enough money, if I had enough enough accomplishment in the world, if we checked enough boxes for travel and parenting and these kind of things, that finally I would could rest, that finally someday this would all be over, so to speak, in a good way, and I could just watch football on the weekends or do whatever the hell I wanted and not have to think about anything anymore. But that's not really fulfilling, actually, it, including now. There's... <laughs> We're doing very well in life and I'm looking for the next challenge. What's the next thing that I can take on for myself? Because we're always on an individual journey and she is too, and she is too. So what are you seeing from the feminine perspective in your professional opinion, Cynthia, with this, that if a man understands that we're each always on a journey, our own individual selves, how does his vibe change? How does his energy change in front of his woman? Yeah, I think that let's say that your wife, your woman, her biggest lesson is to learn allowance in herself, uh, allowance of different parts of her. Like that's re- literally her first step in terms of feeling more love for herself. So if she feels allowance in you, there's a great pressure that can relieve her that she has to have all the answers. There's an allowance of time that it's okay for evolution to take time. And I will, I will say the way, so let's say a woman's on her individual journey and she wants to be in relationship with you. It's not like she is uh, like in a, a man's brain that I'm on my individual journey and that means that I'm totally content in my own world. She may speak that and talk that way and try to put up armor, but women love to be on individual journeys, but know that they are still in connection with someone. And again, I know that might come across as that's not that's not true for her, and that's a lot of her masculine shielding. But the sweet spot in this for her is I'm riding my own horse, I'm learning all these things, and I also have a person riding next to me that I can reach out and touch, and they reach out and touch me. So that's a part of her dream. It's something that she wants, even if she's pushing away right now. Yeah. So to know that's a part of the feminine journey in particular. Yeah. So what was just asked in the chat here, what makes a woman feel like she has to have all the answers? Do they always normally feel that? Well, I'll I'll ask Cynthia that question, but within our own selves, do we feel like we have to have all the answers? And is it normal to feel that? What is our ego talking to us and saying? And I would argue that the more we focus on external accomplishment and validation, the more our ego is going to tell us we don't have all the answers, the more our ego is going to tell us that we're not, we're not done. Something's wrong. And the more we source, some men would say God or purpose through our own selves, uh, taking on voluntary sacrifice, the next voluntary sacrifice in the world is a way that I, as a man and many men feel fulfilled. What would you say about uh, a woman to his question there? What makes her feel like she has to have all the answers and is that normal? Yeah, and I I would lean into, gosh, the human condition that if we have the answers, we will survive, we will feel safe, we will feel fearless. So I think part of the 
women's journey is they kind of what they learn growing up is that there's um, prescription cards or um, recipe cards, if you want to use that metaphor, that if I just follow the perfect recipe, like two cups of flour, three tablespoons of oil, I will have the fairy tale life. Everything will be perfect. Everything will be summer all the time. And so part of her learning and developing is stepping away from that there's always going to be the perfect recipe card. Part of her developing and deepening into her feminine is seeing that parts of the recipe card are blank and to be excited by, I wonder what goes in this space. I wonder what this recipe is going to be. And that takes incredible amount of courage uh, but that's something that really blooms up feminine. Yeah, and, and you have to be willing for that to happen. You have to see that that's okay and welcome that and praise that in her and not be, let's say, upset by that, guys, right? Or defensive or judgmental of that. Because if we're projecting our own shit onto her, right? Okay, second point for today. Her values and perceptions will likely be different than yours. And that's okay. And that's good. And you welcome that. You want to welcome that. You want to welcome her new understanding of her own self. The point of this is she's in therapy in the topic of today. She's working to love herself, find out about herself. And you have to understand that her values and perceptions will likely be different. We only have a couple minutes left, but Cynthia and I, you and I have talked about how a woman will often chameleon herself, especially at the beginning of a relationship to attempt to please and to foster the connection and relationship. And so over time, as she grows her own identity, gentlemen, she may have different values. She may have different perceptions. And at a baseline, that's okay. You may have disagreements. You may need to work on some things. But at a baseline, she's not going to just think exactly like you. That was a mistake I made in the past too. And finally, number three today, you as a man must willingly grasp the next personal challenge in your life to be on a journey, a forever journey of fulfillment. It's voluntarily taking on the next challenge. If a challenge is just shoveled upon you, that's a different thing. It's actually fires a different part of our brain. We feel encumbered by that thing. We feel enslaved by that thing. It may be the same challenge, but if we take it on voluntarily, it fires a different part of your brain. You see it in a different way. And ultimately to feel fulfilled, to feel deep conscious purpose in the masculine, whether a man or a woman, you have to willing, willingly grasp the next personal challenge in your life. If you want to pause the video, check out more of our stuff. And so here's our three points today. Finally, a man wrote, my soon to be ex has become very much like a hummingbird in her own life. It's almost difficult for me to see that she has caged herself off and struggles to find the door. Because I know that I'm not welcome to help guide her to the door because I've now become a tiger at the door. So the, in our last moment here, Cynthia, what is it about a man in this work that knows he needs to allow her to be her own individual? And when she turns to try to ask for his masculine container, because she's walking away like this man, he knows it's not appropriate to offer her the same relationship container. So how, in a positive way, can he see that? How can he see his own need to turn his shoulders, even if she seems to be flailing in her own cage? What positive thing would you say to a man in that spot? Yeah, yeah. And God, I can feel how easy it is for a woman to feel like she still gets to have your masculine container, even though she's put the kibosh on relationship. It's so easy for her. And it's, I don't believe it's, malicious. It's just very instinctual. However, when you are very clear on who you wish to surround with your masculine heart, your container, who you wish to honor, and it's very clear because this person has walked away, I feel the power in you to not have to be in gray area with someone who's walking away. And I also say that that's a really good thing for her to feel and understand that the shift she says she wants has happened. And I want her to feel 
all the things that come with that, because that's really going to put her in touch with what she's truly desiring, whether that's with you or even that you've gifted her the chance to feel in truly what she desires in relationship. And it's like fostering how she moves on with the world as you move on with the world. Thank you. Yeah, well said. Appreciate it. Thanks, Cynthia. Thanks. See you guys next time. Bye, guys.